Okay, um, I think that that's a very, very difficult question. Um, I don't really want to go into the definition of a freedom as opposed to a liberty as opposed to a right. So I'm going to answer that question in terms of human rights. Uh, we've had a lot of debate in this country recently about the importance of freedom of speech, and that's absolutely correct. There is um, great importance to freedom of speech. But I'm not convinced that freedom of speech is necessarily um, you know, more important, for example, than freedom from torture or freedom from racial discrimination. I mean, I tend to um, adopt the idea that um, human rights are indivisible and equally important to each other. So um, that's, a, that's a fairly wet answer, but I think the, they're all very important. Uh, no. Um, the absolute right to freedom of opinion, um, it is correct to call it an absolute right, and maybe an example is uh, the now famous words of our Attorney General about the, um, the right to be a bigot. Um, simply being a bigot, I think, is, is having bigoted thoughts, and really there is freedom of thought, that anybody can think what they like, anybody can have whatever great thought or whatever horrible thought that they have in their head, um, and that is an absolute right. Um, but um, it's, uh, the right becomes more qualified once you begin to act on those opinions. So the right to act like a bigot is different to the right to be a bigot. And so freedom of expression is a much more active right as opposed to simply holding an opinion, which is a passive right. So um, international human rights law certainly, rec uh, certainly um, accepts that freedom of opinion um, is an absolute right, whereas freedom of expression does have some qualifications. Um, having said that, freedom of expression is extremely important, but um, everybody accepts there are some limits, and there are limits in every country, you know, things like, um, well, um, hate speech law, contempt of court, official secrets acts, copyright law, all sorts of, um, you know, every country, even the United States, which has the strongest free speech laws in the world, um, even the United States accepts that there are some limits to freedom of speech. Okay, uh, well, at the moment the law prohibits um, uh, the um, acts, and that includes um, uh, saying, saying things in public, which offend or insult or humiliate or intimidate another person on the basis of race, and that the act is done because of the race of the person. So it's not done accidentally, it's done, you know, kind of targeting the race, uh, the, the person because of their race. And the amendments would remove the prohibition on um, offend and insult and humiliate. Um, it would uh, define intimidate to mean only fear of um, physical, um, physical, attack, physical harm as opposed to psychological harm. And it would add um, a prohibition on vilification, um, which is probably an even, an even higher level of, um, of bad treatment of somebody. Um, my guess is that vilification is effectively um, prohibited under the current law because it's hard to think of something that vilifies which doesn't simultaneously offend or insult or intimidate or um, humiliate. Um, so it would, um, it would actually therefore shrink the scope of prohibited behaviour. Um, and not only that, it would also include an extremely broad defence, um, a defence which um, applies probably to anything said in the media, anything said in an artistic performance, anything said by an academic, um, anything um, regardless of how unreasonable or how lacking in good faith. Because at the moment there is a free speech defence, but um, that defence only applies if the act is done reasonably or in good faith. Um, the famous Andrew Bolt case, Andrew Bolt um, failed to uh, failed to uh, benefit from that defence because it was found he neither acted reasonably or in good faith. But under the new law, um, as I said, the uh, amount of prohibited behaviour would be narrowed, but also the defence would apply to knock out, to provide a complete defence to many acts, even if they intimidate and even if they vilify on the basis of race. Oh, I've, I, I really do agree with that, and um, I would agree that obviously uh, everybody has free speech rights, whether they are powerful um, and rich or whether they happen to lack power. Uh, however, I would also say that the powerful are able to make um, much greater use of speech, and therefore in some respects, obviously I would agree that everyone should have the same rights to speak freely about uh, things, but um, in some institutional senses there can be reasons to perhaps um, constrain some of the speech rights of the powerful. And the um, example I have here, uh, I have in my head, is that I think there are good reasons to restrict the amount of media that, for example, one person might be able to get hold of. Um, because otherwise I think that leads to um, media in a country being too dominated by, you know, just a very, very narrow range of voices. So that's an example where 
um, you know, the powerful could perhaps have too much free speech and therefore need to be constrained. But um, generally, I would agree with uh, Mr. Wilson that um, everybody has free speech.